this with the Word of God. I'm glad to be here. I got excited about your topic, the great mandate. I want you to think about this church being full. Packed. Each and every one of us have family members that aren't Christians. And you know that if they die today, they're lost. Many of you have friends and neighbors that are lost. And what I hope to do today with the word of God is, is that you are compelled and propelled to take that next step in this quest. We're not on a journey. See, a journey is your loss, you're confused, is where you're going. We're on a quest. If you're washed with the blood of Jesus Christ and born again, you know the destiny. The prize is Jesus Christ. And if it's anything else, you're going to be dismayed and disappointed. If you think it's going to be wealth, you'll never have enough. If you think it's going to be marriage, you'll be disappointed. If you think it's going to be children, you'll be saddened. If you have loved ones that die, you're going to be heartbroken. The prize is Jesus Christ. And again, what I hope to do this morning is that we crush these myths, these obstacles that I wrestle with, and I know some of you do too. And your pastor invited me back, and it's, you know, it's a big thing to get invited back. Sometimes you don't get invited back. <laughs> so the last time I was here, um, we talked about discipleship first and foremost in the family, and then in the church, and then from the pulpit. And today we're going to talk about evangelism locally and then abroad. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I just give you the honor and the glory and the praise, and I thank you for this day. This is the day that you've made. And Lord, let ears that, ears that can hear that your word is planted deep in our soul and permeates all of us to sanctification until one day we're glorified and we're with you. I thank you in the name of Jesus. One of the myths out there, or what I see a lot of people struggle with, is what's my purpose, right? That, that sells a lot of books. It fills conferences, on and on and on and on. What's my purpose? What does God have for me, right? And the error in that is that we tend to focus on subjective matters. The subjectivity. What's God have for me? What is God going to do with me? You see? And my advice to you is to focus on what's objective. The Word of God. Jesus clearly says the harvest is ready, but the laborers are few. The Great Commission. Go out and make disciples. That's objective. We've all been called. You see? So let's start with the objectivity. A lot of people fall in that trap and they say, well, my faith is private, right? You'll hear a lot of people say, well, you know, my faith is private. Well, we know the word of God says, if you're ashamed of me before man, I will be ashamed of you before my father. It's, we need to be the salt of the earth, the light in this earth. We, we're the glory of God to shine on our faces that we can take the good news. So focus on the objective matters. Another big one is, I'm not qualified, right? I, I, I don't know. I, I, you know, I look at my family. I was the first kid to get disqualified in the spelling bee as a little kid. I remember it got so bad, the teacher says, David, you don't have to play. I remember there was a group A, B, C. I was always in group C. So I wasn't very bright. I grew up on the wrong side of the railroad tracks. I don't come from a family of elite and noble blood. I went to the worst schools in the inner city. And you're constantly bombarded that you're not good enough, that you can't, that I don't know. I don't know how. Have you ever gotten a job that you don't qualify and you got the job? Have you ever had that experience? Some of you aren't old enough. <laughs> but if you feel that you're not qualified, you're hired. Let's see what the Word of God says, okay? 
I'm just going to read some passages to you before we get into the text. It's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 26 to 31. It says, For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to the worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that, as it is written, let the one who boasts Boast in the Lord. I could talk about Jesus all day long. I could talk about the glory of God all day long. I can elevate God's name all day long. I don't have to talk about myself. I don't have to talk about all my errors and my dumb things that I've done in my life and, and the mistakes I've done and the people I've hurt. I don't have to talk about that because there's nothing there but to elevate Jesus Christ. And the question is, is, can you do that? The second problem that I see is in this world is people don't believe the Bible, right? You'll hear a lot of people. You'll hear a lot of people quoting the Bible, like one verse or one thing people will say, God helps those that help themselves. Well, did you know that's not even in the Bible? And you see these politicians quoting <laughs> when it's convenient, it fits into their narrative to win the argument. And people don't believe the Bible. That's okay. The question I have for you is, do you believe the Bible? See, one of the problems that I see before I was a Christian talking to Christians was they didn't know what they were talking about. And one of the problems that you'll see when you talk to people of other faiths, Jews, Hindus, Muslims, they know what they're talking about. Do you know what you're talking about? Do you believe in what you're talking about? See, you don't have to get a degree in theology or a degree in Bible study or get the PhD in the philosophy or know the latest arguments of the atheists. All you have to know is know the word of God and, and do you believe it? One of the problems I find today, even among us Christians, is not that we don't know the Bible. It's we really don't believe it. And, and if you ask yourself in your hearts of hearts, do you really believe it? I don't want run around by blind faith. Let me explain to you. This is Peter talking to us in 2 Peter 1, verse 16 to 21. For we did not follow clever devised myths when we made known to you the power and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of the majesty. Eyewitnesses. This wasn't faith. This wasn't blind faith. There was eyewitnesses. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven. For we were with him on the holy mountain. Peter and the disciples witnessed the transfiguration of Jesus Christ. They witnessed the baptism of Jesus Christ. They were eyewitnesses, and they saw this. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in the dark place until the day dawns and the morning stars rise in your hearts. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? A lot of people say, well, David, I, I want to talk to people about Jesus, but they don't believe the Bible. Now let's get this picture in your head. You're going to go to battle, and you have your sword. 
the enemy has their sword. And the enemy tells you, I don't believe in your sword. What will you do? Retrieve and put it away? Or cut them with the word of God? Do you believe the Bible is the question. You don't need to defend the Bible, friends. That's not our task. If you have a lion, let it loose. You don't need to protect the lion. The word of God is the power, spoken word of God. We, we, do we believe it is the question. Now, let me, let me unravel that for you and what I mean. I'll go slow so you're taking notes. Because when you young people go to college and you go to the university or to uh, high school, you're going to come out and you're going to say, well, I grew up in church. So? He grew up in the mosque. Well, that's what my parents believe. Well, his parents believe this. You see? So you're losing credibility. Not because of the gospel or because of Jesus. is because we're clueless. We're proclaiming something that we know nothing about. And some of us make the error in saying, it's my story. Right? You hear that a lot. Well, he, Joe has a story. Mary has a story. Billy has a story. Let me tell you about stories. There was a young man. He was, uh, grew up in the Midwest. A little African-American kid. His parents got divorced or his father died. He was shipped off to his sister in Boston. And he grew up with his older sister and one thing led to another, and he got in trouble with the law. He became a juvenile delinquent. He got locked up, got out, started stealing cars, started drinking, started selling drugs, got into uh, pimping and prostitution, etc. And he landed in the Massachusetts State Penitentiary. And a man came up to him and said, you need to change your life. You need to change or you're not going to live long. And he had a conversion. He had a story. He had a vision. And do you know that man changed his life from pimping and drug dealing and uh, prostitution and, and alcohol abuse? And he became one of the most proliferative preachers of the 60s. His name was Malcolm X. And before he died, he said... The Muhammad Elijah is a farce. The Muhammad Elijah, it's a lie. You can't bank on your story, friends. Because it, as I read to you, let no one boast, but in God alone, in Christ alone. See, your story is a footnote to the gospel. It's not the story. Let me explain to you. The Bible is a collection of reliable historical documents. Acts was written by Luke. Luke was a Greek physician. At that time, the Greeks were the best in medicine. It's kind of like in the United States today. Luke, when you read the Gospel of Luke, if you see, he records it historically, accurately to the best of his ability. When he writes the book of Acts, he's writing historically. So the Bible is filled with historical documents, okay? The second thing is, it's written by eyewitnesses, verified by other live witnesses. You see, in a crime, if you were to commit a crime, there has to be at least two witnesses to get a conviction. You see, there was over 500 people that witnessed that Jesus resurrected and ascended back to the Father. Over 500 witnesses. And they could all collaborate the story. This is not blind faith, the resurrection. It was written by over 40 authors, kings and peasants, fishermen and tax collectors. It was written in three languages. It was written in Hebrew, Aromatic, and Greek. You see, you have to know what you believe. Okay? And this is how it works. When I talk to my Islamic doctor friends and colleagues, 
we have these conversations. Now, I don't know everything about Islamic. I know some, but I know what I believe. And what he'll say to me, he goes, your Bible is written by many people. I go, I know. Eyewitnesses, they could all collaborate the same story. He goes, yeah, but your Bible is written in three languages, and then you have all these translations. The Quran is written in one language by one person. I go, that's my problem with it. Nobody can collaborate the story. And they look at you. You see? You don't have to know what everybody else believes and all the philosophies and the religions of the world. Do you know what you believe? Do you believe the Bible? Reports of supernatural events. Jesus was dead on Friday and he's resurrected on Sunday. There was eyewitnesses. Fulfilled of specific prophecies. Moses spoke of Jesus. The Psalms spoke of Jesus. Isaiah spoke of Jesus. Then when Jesus is on the road, he's talking to these people in Luke. At the end of Luke, he, and they're sad. He goes, he goes uh, don't you know what happened? He goes, all the prophecies were to talk about Jesus, the power of Jesus and the resurrection. You see, there's over 300 prophecies fulfilled. Writings were divine and not human, humans, uh, not humans. Scripture was written by man, but it was divine writings by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, many people will say, well, see, the Bible's written by man. Everything we read was written by man. So we disqualify the algebra books. We, we disqualify the history books. Do we disqualify the philosophy books? No. Yes, the Bible was written by man but it was inspired by the Holy Spirit. Over 1,500 years, 40 authors in three continents, Africa, Asia, and Europe, and they all collaborate the same story. But David, it's not science. Of course not. It's a historical document. It's a historical document. And now you can take classes in biblical uh, history and they're starting to get relics and artifacts from, from tribes in the ancient world that verify scriptures. We don't live by faith. We have the word of God. We're not guessing, friends. Do you believe it? Do you believe the Bible? That's the question I have for you. And one of the reasons we can't proclaim the gospel is because we have a hard time believing it. Another thing that we deal with is we're afraid. I get it. The world is hostile. The world doesn't want to hear it. One of the most offensive things you could say today is that Jesus said, I am the truth, the way, and the life. Because what do you hear in school, young people? There's many ways to God, right? There, you, it's truth for you. It's truth for me. Wait a minute. If I say I'm going to Chicago... It's north, right? If I go south, I'm not going to get to Chicago. So the logic behind that doesn't even make sense. Jesus said, I am the truth, the way, and the life is one of the most offensive things. The gospel back in the book of Acts was offensive. To the, Ro to the Jew, it was a stumbling block, the cross. What? God die on a cross? That's a curse. I don't believe that. I don't want to believe that. And to the Greeks, resurrection was foolishness too. A God die and then resurrect? Nonsense. Foolishness. Anybody who says that is a fool. Nothing has changed. The gospel, I have realized, the gospel is difficult to believe. That's why it's the power of the Holy Spirit. Our role is to put the sail up and let the power of God just reveal to that individual. And Paul gives us an example. See, Paul was going through this time just like we are. Nothing different. Paganism, all the philosophies and all the religions and were going on at this time. There's nothing new. I know when you're young, you think it's new. But I can tell those individuals here with white hair like me, there's nothing new under the sun. It's just repackaged different. Live long enough and you'll see bell bottoms come and go. Sideburns come and go. Short hair, long hair come and go. Right? 
There's nothing new under the sun. So Paul gives us a good example. It's found in Acts chapter 17, starting in verse, verse 16. Now Paul, wherever Paul went, there was a riot or a revival. <laughs> a riot or a revival, and sometimes both. Before I became a Christian, there was some boys or young people that I hung around with that every time we would go to a dance or every time we went to, there was a fight. There was trouble. So I don't have any Christian friends that everywhere they go, there's a riot or a revival. So it's very difficult. But, but wherever Paul went, there was a riot or a revival. So now Paul is it now, it says, now while Paul was waiting for them at Athens. See, Paul was ministry with a group of guys. And I bet you these guys were saying, you know what? Paul's trouble. Why don't you go ahead, Paul, and wait for us there? But knowing Paul, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. See, Paul gets to this, this city. I went to uh, Thailand and I went to Miramar. There's idols everywhere. In the streets, in the marketplace, everywhere you go, there's idols. So Paul sees all these idols, but he was provoked. He was provoked. It bothered him. He was, he was washed with the blood of Jesus Christ, born again, a Jew of Jew from the tribe of Benjamin, and it had hoard him seeing all these idols. One of the problems that I find in my life as well is sin doesn't bother us. Sin doesn't bother us. We see movie stars. We see singers. We see people of, of uh, affluence. And we idolize them. We want to be like them. But not so with Paul. The idols provoked him. Sin bothered him. So listen to what Paul says. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day. Marketplace. This would be like uh, Hollywood uh, Sunset Boulevard. This would be like in Manhattan Times Square. This was who was who and the action was happening. It's not like going to Walgreens or Walmart. No. This was a central location. And, P and Paul is proclaiming the gospel with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicureans and the Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Babbler, okay? That's mockery. If someone calls you a babbler in this time, that was the worst insult you could be called. Homer, a great philosopher, would say that uh, to bring, it was a, a culture of honor and shame. So to have a good name was honorable. To be called a babbler was dishonor. And they're calling Paul a babbler. A babbler is someone who picks up seeds, chews them, and spits them out. So it means that you're just babbling. You don't know what you're talking about. And these people were calling Paul a babbler. But others said he seems to be preaching of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and resurrection. See, a lot of people think, well, in order to win people, you got to water down the gospel. Some people will say, in order to, then you're not too churchy or too, too Bible, too Jesus, you know, you got to water it down. P Paul was preaching the gospel. See, you got to understand something about the gospel. It's either you're going to run to or you're going to run away. There's no in-betweens. I've lived long enough to know that, and I've seen it in my life. So they said, who are these foreign divinities? See, these guys, these philosophers, these professors, the great minds of the time were inquisitive. Tell us about, the, or what about these divinities? And they took him and brought him to Aerobagus, uh, the uh, Mars Hill. This was the Oprah show of the time. The platform of platforms, Paul. Now, notice how he got there. He didn't get there by compromising, watering down the gospel. He got there by proclaiming the gospel. And now he's on the stage of stage of his time. May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting, for you bring some strange things to our ears. 
We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now all the Athians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. These were the who-whos of the time, the most influential people, the greatest minds of the time, and they invite Paul to hear more about this divinities that he's talking about. But you and I know that Paul was preaching the gospel. Now here goes the lesson for us. You don't water down the gospel. You know the gospel. You proclaim the gospel accurately and correctly. First and foremost, do you believe it? Do you believe? You can't tell people something that you don't believe. But here's how Paul does it. The overarching meta-narrative of the Christian worldview, in a nutshell, how he presents it to these people that are mocking him, people that don't believe, people that think that Paul's crazy, and this is how he proclaims the gospel. And here you go. Ready? Creation, fall, redemption, consummation. Ready? Creation, fall, redemption, consummation. So Paul, standing in the midst of Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. <laughs> he acknowledged their culture. He didn't compromise. He wasn't offended by it. And he didn't back down by it. But he acknowledges the culture. What you and I need to do is we need to acknowledge the culture. There's a culture out there that is lost and confused. There's a culture out there that they may look like they have it together, but the world is in panic. What is going on? Are we sensitive in observing our culture? For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. To the unknown God, what therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. You see that? He's got a foot inside using their culture, but he doesn't water down the gospel. He doesn't back down. He doesn't compromise. He sees a foothold. The other day I was at a, a get-together with some friends that aren't Christians, and the word, I was able to slip the word in grace. Because they said, wow, Dave, it's amazing you did this. I go, the grace of God. And they looked at me, what do you mean? You see a slip in there to presenting the gospel. And that's what Paul did. So let's see what, how he starts off. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything. There he's talking about creation. God does not need anything, and he doesn't need me. And every day it's proven because people die and the world keeps going. Since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. If you go to college today, you're going to find professors, they, are, they believe in God as deists. And deists believe that, okay, yeah, God might have made everything. That's cool, the Big Bang Theory, whatever happens. Yeah, there's a God. Okay, big deal. But here Paul's saying he sustains life. That means that God is active each and every day. That's offensive to some people. Why? We want to do what we want to do. We don't want to be accountable to anyone. We don't want to answer to anybody or anything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling places, that they should seek God and perhaps fill their way towards him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for he, for we are indeed his offspring. That's creation. Now the fall. For in him we live and move and have our beings, as even some of your poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like 
gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. This creator, the unknown God that I'm telling you, he's the creator, sustains life. You have offended him by believing you can put him in a box, make something up, and call it a God. You have offended God. We all have fallen short of the glory of God. Our works are dirty rags. That is offensive to people today. You have to understand that. You are a sinner. I am a sinner in need of a savior. Now, redemption. Now, the glory and the grace of God. The time of ignorance God overlooked. Okay, you were ignorant to this point. <laughs> but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Repentance. The world today does not want to repent, friends. How many of you struggled when you first heard the gospel? What? I got to break up with so-and-so. I can't do this. I can't do that. I, you know, we struggled. What's wrong with me? I'm not as bad as everybody else. That is the world today. And you have to acknowledge that. That's why churches aren't filled today. We don't want to repent. And then now consummation. Because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man who he has appointed. And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. The gospel, the life, the death, the resurrection, the glory of Jesus Christ, the gospel. It's offensive to people. It was offensive to the audience. There he goes with resurrection again. But remember, when he was proclaiming the gospels, what got him on the platform. But he continues proclaiming the gospel. And listen how it, the narrative finishes. Now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. But others said, we will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from the midst. But some men joined him and believed among whom also were Dionysus, the Areopagite, and a woman named Dionysus, and others with him. Some mocked, some wanted to hear more, and some believed. This morning, some of you, that guy is crazy. Hernandez is crazy. You'll mock me. That's okay. Some of you are going to want to hear more. You got an amazing pastor. Your pastor enjoys the word of God, but he even enjoys more teaching it and proclaiming it. Don't ever leave this church without asking questions. Don't ever leave this church that there's something that the Holy Spirit is prompting you to get answers. You got a pastor and you got leaders and elders here that love the word, but more importantly, they love God and they're willing to share with you. And some believed. The question I have for you this morning is do you believe? Do you believe? I believe with all the fiber in me. I believe it. No matter what happens, what comes, I believe Jesus Christ is my Savior and Lord. The other day at work, there was a lady. About three or four years ago, my wife and I, we were doing a class at our church. I invited her. It was a class for uh, senior citizens, people 55 and over. See, the beauty about being 55 and over is you're closer to seeing Jesus. That's a beautiful thing. But there's a lot of things we got to do before we get there. So that's what the class was about. So I invited her. Nah, you know, nah, you know. She comes to me, I think it was last week. She comes to me and she goes, what was that class you were teaching? You see. Now, it would have been real easy to say, tell her where I go to church. Because that's what she was asking. Where do you go to church? I told her. But you can't stop there. I was telling her about my Lord Jesus Christ. I said, you know, I got a wonderful marriage. I got wonderful kids. I got a great profession. I, I'm wealthy. I'm blessed. I got my health. I got everything. But if I lose it all, I still have Jesus. And she's looking at me. That's what you need. Because you've tried living with men and it doesn't work. You've tried this and it doesn't work. You need Jesus. And man, she was about ready to ball in the hallway at the hospital. 
Another uh, patient of mine comes. She's got a, uh, uh, a disease, and uh, she wanted me to talk to her husband. Her husband's in law enforcement. And uh, he, he comes, and she wanted me to talk to her husband because he was with other women committing adultery. Good Catholic. And uh, he's committing adultery, and he comes. And I start talking to him. I said to him, I said, I want to thank you for being in law enforcement. I know your job is very difficult. I know that you could do a thousand things right, but one thing wrong is splattered on the six o'clock news or the front page of the monitor. I understand that. I said to him, I said, what is your coping mechanism? You know, domestic violence is, is twice as high than the normal population. Alcoholism is higher than the normal population. What are you doing to protect yourself? What keeps you from going into a drug bus, seeing a million dollars hard code cash, and you're not tempted to take $50,000 and walk away knowing you can get away with it? What is your safety mechanism? He's just looking at me. I said, your family needs you. Your children need you. Your wife needs you. And this is a big man. And he's, starting, he's about ready to ball. And I said, can I pray with you? You see? Be faithful with the little. Be faithful here at church. If you got a, 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 you're a Sunday school teacher, be the best. If you got a small home group, be the best. If you're part of the young people's group, be the best. And see how God can use you to the next level. God has taken me all over the world teaching and proclaiming the gospel. And uh, last month, the greatest honor, I got to speak at my father's funeral to my family that aren't Christians, proclaiming the gospel. Friends, no time for play, no time for games. You have a pastor that wants to see the kingdom of God. Do you?